could you explain us the apparent gap <coughs> between the commitments of European leaders to strengthen the internal market and the fact that in real life, as I mentioned before, almost every member state is not totally complying with the rules. I think first of all we have to realise that that's not just a European problem. That's been a problem in world trade liberalisation over the past 60 years. Even if we look at the moment, probably every country bar three in the world will be committed to free trade. But yet the Doha round doesn't work. We have spent 60 years and we still haven't got a complete free trade in manufacturers even in the world. So it's not surprising that there's a big gap between the principle and the practice. And as John mentioned in his speech, one of the reasons is that basically the losers are the people who face competition from abroad. They're clearly identified. They know what they lose. So they're, as it were, energized to defend it. Whereas very often the gains are somewhere out there, they're spurious, they're somewhere in the future, but they're not definite. In many respects, the European Union has made tremendous advances in integrating its market compared to the rest of the world's efforts. Now, there's lots more to be done, as John has mentioned, but there have been huge achievements in terms of removing barriers. One of the crucial things, I think, for the future is not so much, which might seem paradoxical at the moment, not so much the current crisis about the euro. The euro will not disappear. It will stay. Um, it's not so much the crisis about the banks, because they will be solved eventually. It's not so much the crisis about the public finances. It's really the crisis about the capability of the European economy to produce goods and services in competition with the world, which enables us to keep the standard of living to which we've become accustomed. And of course, the single market was going to have two effects. One was the obvious one that we'd remove some of the inefficiencies, we'd remove some of the excess costs of documentation, customs posts, and so on. But the other bit, which it's kind of failed in, that it was going to create this great dynamic as regards industrial entrepreneurial activity. It was going to increase competition. It was going to remove national champions and national protection. And from that competition, we were going to get mergers, bigger companies, we were going to get increased innovation, better scale, and in turn, that would enable us to compete better. At the time, it was against Japan and the United States. Now it's very much against China and India, as well as Japan and the United States. So I would think there is a burning need within Europe, not just, of course, to solve its financial problems, but to think much more seriously about the kind of things which will develop the real economy in Europe and how a revitalized European single market could contribute to that. But the bottom line would be the single market will not be the source of growth. It will contribute. Success in Europe comes down to the classic economic virtues of efficiency, capability, quality of product, innovation, research and development, and a capacity to organize our economies competently and capably relative to the rest of the world. Thank you.